Okay. Uh, good good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Sea, Air, and Space Navy League uh, discussion. Or we'll have a fireside chat actually here today, and our topic is going to be warfighter brain health, a traumatic brain injury, and the invisible wounds. I'm Captain Scott Cota. I'm the Branch Chief at Traumatic Brain Injury Center of Excellence, uh, which is Defense Health Agency Research and Engineering Branch. And I'm happy to be here with my colleagues, STEAM colleagues here today, to, so that we can talk about this particular subject. So uh, we'll start out just kind of by leveling the bubbles for the group and uh, get an intro of our panelists and uh, find out how their organizations are viewing Warfighter Brain Health. So I'll turn it over to you, Admiral. Thank you, Captain Coda. So I'm Admiral Dana Thomas. I'm the Assistant Commandant for Health, Safety, and Work Life. That includes being the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Safety Officer, and just the General Chief of Wellbeing for the United States Coast Guard. I've had this position for five years, and it has really been a I think if I came in and said there were three things I needed to do, one of the foremost things I needed to do was raise awareness around mental health, behavioral health, causes of people's um, mental health and behavioral health issues, and what we can do about it. So in order to do something about it, you have to have more staff. So we've probably added about uh, 25 officers and another 25 behavioral health technicians, just so that you have someone to talk to whether you find you're speaking more slowly, thinking more slowly, um, could be your depression, could be your anxiety, you know, could be, could be any number of things. But I think that creating that safe space was done in two ways. One, owning the billets and the bodies that came in to do this. And the second is by really promoting something that we've done um, for over four years now called Wellness Wednesday. And Wellness Wednesday has given the entire Coast Guard a chance to have a panel hosted by me every Wednesday. Uh, myself, along with the chaplains, we picked topics that could have been, you know, suicidality. They could have been, you know, coping with uh, marital breakup. They could have been how to deal with your uh, relentless shoulder pain. You know, it, so it's like it really didn't matter what aspect of your physical or psychological health it was, but it was really basically trying to just get people to take the silver line, lining of COVID was that nobody's fine, right? So it gives us, gave us a chance to talk into the space of, if you're telling me you're fine, I have to say, no, really, Captain Coda, how are you doing? <laughs> because this, is a, this was so traumatic for the entire uh, globe. But with that, I'll pass it over to you, sir. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here and being on this distinguished panel. I'm Dr. Dan Pearl, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a pathologist who, with expertise in brain disease, neuropathologist. And uh, in 2010, I was recruited to the Uniform Services University with the mission of developing a brain bank to study brain health uh, in military service members. Um, and that's, we, we started in 2012 uh, collecting brains of individuals who have died, whose families agreed to donate the brain for use in research. At the time when we started, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of opinion was that exposure to blast did not damage the brain, and that any subsequent sequela that one saw was really a mental health issue as opposed to a biologic issue. So my mission was to look at brains uh, in particular, to sort this out to see, because nobody had really looked at these at these specimens uh, over the years, uh, despite the fact that uh, literally hundreds of thousands of service members had been exposed to blast uh, in their military careers. Um, and actually, uh, to make a long story short, we did find specific lesions related to blast exposure in these brains, which we think are of clinical importance. Uh, and uh, at this point now, we've actually collected approximately 400 military brain specimens um, uh, that we examine uh, in great detail, 
and uh, also make these specimens available to qualified researchers throughout the country and throughout the world who also want to do research on this subject. So uh, why don't we leave it at that, and I'm sure we'll get back to the details. Oh yeah, we'll hit the details. <laughs> Go ahead, over to you, Jen. Great, so thank you for having me. I'm really, it's great to be with you all. Um, I'm Jen Zients, and I'm from the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas. And we are a clinical research and translational group that is looking uniquely at how the brain is in health across the lifespan. So we are extremely interested in how do people, even in after concussive, events, how do we continue to thrive beyond that? And when we look at brain health, we really define brain health in the way that the World Health Organization defines brain health as the optimal continual development, not just of your cognition, but also of your well-being, of your, um, of your, all of your physical health. But we add into this connectedness and looking at how people are actually connected to the people and the purposes that they have in their own lives. And so we've been working with the military for more than a dozen years and working directly with operators to train them in brain skills training and giving them assessment tools that are looking at upward potential rather than focusing solely on deficit model. So everybody that we get to work with, we're really coming at it from a performance basis, not a medical model. So I think that gives us a unique position um, to try to help to destigmatize, which is one of my biggest um, kind of soapboxes when it comes to the military is the need to destigmatize. So I know we'll get to talk more about how we do all of this work. Very good, thank you very much. So let's talk about numbers and kind of scope this thing a little bit and then I'll get into generalizable questions. Um, so since 2000, nearly 500,000 TBIs have been diagnosed in our, our force. 80% uh, of those we know are mild concussion types of uh, injuries. And those are the ones that are diagnosed, the ones that are not reported. So the number's probably way greater, right? Um, we understand that. So with regard to your organizations um, and kind of the concept of warfighter brain health, what do you think is the biggest challenge to our service members moving forward uh, within that realm of either exposures or events and TBI or um, with the whole program of warfighter brain health. And I'll turn that over to you, Admiral. Uh, thank you, Captain Coda. So you know, I, I've given some thought to this, like in the maritime industry or in our space within the maritime you know, operations world, we have you know, a couple of groups that, are, that jump out as the high propensity, potentially, you know, um, most likely to have some intracranial uh, trauma that would not be just a standard TBI, but almost like in a repetitive uh, way that one would drive boats fast. I think of the, the MSRT, the, the Maritime um, Safety Response Teams, these are, and, the, and the MSSTs, the Maritime Safety Security Teams, these are our deployable special forces. And so the, the coxswains there, the, the boats, the boats that, that, that come out from the SMTC, the, the Special Missions Tactical you know, Training School at Camp Lejeune, where we train 800 uh, Coasties and, 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 and Navy you know, bosuns to, to do this tactical coxswain work. They, they come out of that training, they're gonna inevitably dri be driving boats fast, probably for a lot of their career. And you know, there seems like there would be some, some significant risk in that space. Um, we would look also at, we have surfmen, and surfmen are defined by, do you have water in the area that your, your base is that is um, eight feet or higher, more than 10% of the air? And then there's a heavy weather coxswains or you know, surfmen that would be eight feet or higher, 10% or more of the year, or 30 knot winds. But these are small vessels, right? And some of these vessels, like the surfmen bring out, these vessels actually roll over. So if you can imagine being in your boat and it rolls over, you know, I mean, I think I'm going out, I'm leaving today and I'm gonna to visit Cape Disappointment. I mean, you just can't buy advertising like that, right? Cape Disappointment out on the Columbia River in, uh, in Washington State. Because the, the, previously the sailors would think they were coming in, but those sandbars would get them every time. 
So you have like, we're always going out in bad weather to get people. And it's hard on the, it's, when you're doing this jostly type of work, it's hard on every joint in your body. It's hard on your, your entire musculoskeletal system. But why would we not think that that also took the wear and tear on our brains? So the, the, the third group I would just mention, it's a little, it, you know, it's maritime-esque because it's, it's my aviation survival technicians. So these ASTs, they're often um, brought down on a hoist line and maybe they're dropped into the water. Maybe it's 30 or 40 feet above the water, but maybe the swells are 40 feet, like you're in the Bering Sea. And I can tell you, hitting the water like that is like hitting concrete. So do we do enough to assess injuries in that group of people? Who we also know, I think, on a fairly regular basis, do dangerous work. Well, I think that that concept, because I'm familiar with SMTC having done some work out at Camp Lejeune. So, the jostling factor, but also going through their weapons training Absolutely. and exposure to blasts simultaneously. So it's not just impact and jostling, but also blast exposure. Correct. And then longitudinal evaluation or monitoring of those individuals is kind of, again, a critical component of warfighter brain health. Um, so you think that will be beneficial long-term? I do, and I think that you know, one, one study that we have that's ongoing right now, um, the Office of the Naval Research is um, a accelerometer study that is going to be pairing you know, the speeds at which people are stopping and starting the driving of these vessels, but also it's going to be paired with some um, functional MRIs, and some MRIs to see if, if before we get to your study, there might be even things we could notice in a, uh, in, a, in a crew member that needs to be addressed earlier or break, break, we have done enough for this crew member's career. Yeah, that's good. And so I think that's a good transition, right? So Dr. Pearl, um, in your experience and through your work, talk about the differences in impact and blast and some of the findings you've had, and then maybe a little bit about in vivo versus post-mortem opportunities. Sure. Yeah, the first, first principle is that there are two types of TBI, or traumatic brain injury, basically. One is impact, which is what you generally think of in terms of traumatic brain injury, hitting your head. Uh, you know, a fall, um, motor vehicle accident, a fight, uh, that's impact TBI. The second kind is blast, exposure to a high explosive and the blast wave. And those are two very different phenomena. They have different physics, and they produce different kinds of damage to the brain. Uh, and um, in looking at this, I mean, not infrequently, blast is associated with impact, but there are many different uh, situations in which it's purely blast or purely impact. Uh, and so in looking at exposures, this gets pretty complex. Uh, uh, because the, the results are different. It's interesting in that the, the, the sequelae, the long-term effects, though, have a great deal of overlap between impact and, and blast, but the pathology is very different. Uh, and that's what we're finding in our, in our post-mortem studies. Um, one of the problems in this whole area is the fact that um, in in dealing with an individual who's still alive who, who is suffering from these long-term effects, uh, diagnosis is difficult because we don't have a, a, a biomarker. We don't have a, a signature change on, let's say, uh, MRI imaging uh, that can sort out the two, um, or even the presence of such lesions. Um, we're working on that, and actually, based on, on our pathology findings, uh, we've been working with some pioneers in, in the MRI, the new forms of MRI imaging, and they're beginning to see these lesions, at least on post-mortem specimens, uh, which is the first step towards reaching the clinic. Uh, they're now working very hard to, to convert that to clinical imaging. Uh, that's probably gonna take a year or two more, but if they're successful in this, and we're still awaiting these results, we may well be on our way to having a clinical means by which we can detect these, the, uh, this kind of damage so that the, the so-called invisible wound will then finally become visible, which is one of our major aims and will be a 
important step in, uh, in, in advance in clinical medicine. Um, um, the kinds of exposures that, that one gets um, um, in terms of the Coast Guard would be very interesting, and the more we're, we're getting into this space, the more we're learning in terms of some of the unique exposures that uh, individuals in the Coast Guard might get. And we're becoming increasingly concerned about this jostling in fast boats uh, and its potential effects on the brain. And we're studying this at the moment. Have some preliminary data that's somewhat concerning. And uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing about that in the, in the near future. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and, and Jen, can we talk a little bit about getting into that realm of performance, right? So uh, there's been a lot of discussion, the 734 work with the longitudinal study that recently closed out, um, looking for performance parameters. Um, how does your program view that and what tools are used um, to uncover that particular aspect of warfighter brain health? You bet, well, first of all, I think awareness is kind of part of the starting point to what the Admiral was saying. And there is really a lack of awareness um, that individuals possess knowing that your brain changes every single day and that neuroplasticity is driven by your own experiences and what you do with your experiences. And so I think that's one of the big things that we really do is we educate individuals and empower them to realize the agency that they have. We do um, performance-based assessments, as I mentioned earlier, where we are looking holistically at somebody's brain health and performance, and we're not, looking we're not looking for disease and diagnosis. We're not a clinic. We don't see people in inpatient kind of acute phases. We have seen people way past in chronic phases. You know, for anyone who's gone to medical school, the, what chronic is defined as six months to a year post-injury. We have seen in our folks, in our chronic studies, people on average of eight years, but even beyond that, to up to 20 years. And the, uh, the ability, number one, for people to get, diag I'm not, not diagnostic, assessment information provides them with more targets of opportunity, not just focused on my deficit area or something I may be concerned with or thinking I want to improve, but performance looking at clarity of thinking which is really someone's ability to be proactive and to be able to recognize possibilities for themselves, to be strategic in how they're taking in and manipulating information for their use. Emotional balance, how well are we able to deal with adversity? And connectedness, how much purpose do we feel in the kinds of activities and the people in which we interact? And these three things, I think, help us to give a very good performance-based metric that we can launch from. There are as I've just said, there's multiple targets of opportunity that come from this assessment. And when individuals start to see that it isn't just about work, it isn't just about my memory, it isn't just about my speed of processing, that there's all of these things that actually trickle down and have bigger impact across all of our cognitive functions, that is one of the starting places, I think, for a performance-based kind of metric. Likewise, because there isn't, even when people do know that there's something that you can that, that I know that my brain changes. Having proper skills, the brain skills, so that we are minimizing the toxic habits that we engage in while we are doing more of the healthy things that our brain was actually designed, the way that it was designed to think, helps us to actually leverage that neuroplasticity in better ways. And so that's really what our program is doing, is we're trying to, we are teaching individuals and training them to use a set of nine strategies that are top-down strategies and that get at bigger picture thinking, more innovative strategic ability to use, take in and use information. And I think that when we've seen that also having this awareness level of your own ability to change, I keep saying this, this is my big thing, is about stigma. And I think in the military there is such a great pride in our skills and our performance that we, Everybody that I've ever worked with understands the ability to sharpen the knife. We can do this with our brain skills as well. It's not just about our physical performance, that our, our cognitive health can also get strengthened. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great concept. The, the whole idea of resiliency or thriving um, to be built in. It's, you know, professional athletes use that type of concept all the time. 
um, having to battle through injury and get back to their performance levels. Um, so the idea of post-traumatic growth, um, so you're injured, right? In the current model, you're injured and, and you're put into an injury pattern rather than you're injured and you'll recover. We understand that and there are certain concepts that um, that lead to worse outcomes, whether they be the addition of PTS or anxiety or pain syndromes that could potentially add to worsening outcomes. Um, but if it's in the model of you will get stronger, the, the potential for post-traumatic growth, how do you think um, that would be formative to our force overall, Admiral? Just kind of, if, if we kind of flip the script on how we approach this. Oh, thank you again, Dr. Cota. This is a, it's an area that I'm very, very interested in because, you know, I'm, I'm, post-traumatic distress exists, but it's a larger marker of how well you will do if you look at a person and say, well, how do you actually integrate this experience that's happened and not make it, I don't define myself by that one experience. Because lots of things can be distressing. I mean, incredibly distressing from you know, military sexual trauma to recovering dead bodies to having to tell families that, 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 that you know, your sons, you know, we're not gonna be able to recover it, crawling off this search. There's so many things that over time we can carry and harbor that then you know, I think what we see oftentimes is rather than taking the more creative tools uh, of, of how would I help myself, we take the easy tools. And what do the easy buttons look like? Um, they can look as almost harmless as uh, using my phone incessantly. Using my phone incessantly to scroll through things. Anytime, I ask you this, anytime that your attention is not where you are choosing to place it, stop and just realize someone else is feeding you that. Someone else's algorithm is feeding you that. Because without our ability to have attention, there is no creativity. There is no innovation. I don't need a show of hands, but if I ask a lot of people that are adults, you know, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, do you focus better now or when you were in high school? Okay, in high school I could study for plenty of exams. But if I can't bring myself to focus my mind on ideas, because there's so much distraction in my world, these are things that I'm choosing to allow in. Just like I could either take my, my struggles and I could struggle and suffer or I could struggle well. And part of how you struggle well is you integrate the experience into your life. It's not the only thing that defines you, but it's something that I find like group trauma works group trauma new therapy works very, very well because all of a sudden I'm not the only person suffering from this malady and this thing that's made me terminally unique in my life and that I couldn't share or tell about. But now I've got six other people, eight other people in a room in a safe space where we can all talk about how that trauma impacted us and sort of move through it together. I think one of the most helpful things in that type of group work is really we in the military often suck it up, you know, and it's like, well, it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that bad, but then I hear Jen's story, and I'm like, that was terrible what happened to you. And that's the break for me when I get to acknowledge what happened to me was really bad too. And it's like, you don't ignore what's happened, you integrate what's happened, and you just don't let it, you know, be the only thing that yeah, like experience to be able to grow as a team. Um, coming out of the soft community, that was critically important for those operators to be together and move through scenarios together, whether it be loss of a teammate or other experiences that they had. And soft did this better than any other community in terms of training their own to become their mental health providers. Because then there's so many fewer words you have to explain if the person's from that community. And understands they what under, they go through. They yeah. understand already what you went through and you know you're not going to be shamed. Very good. And Dr. Pearl, in your experience and where the research is heading, um, some of the regions that you've identified, um, are is there is there an opportunity if someone 
is diagnosed in vivo, you know, um, that we can employ strategies and techniques to overcome those exposures and those areas that were exposed in the brain? Sure. <clears throat> I think the first thing is that we need to identify the nature of the, the damage that's occurred. If we're going to be develop any kind of rational approach to diagnosis, prevention, and particularly treatment, we need to know what the enemy is. We need to know how the brain has been damaged so that we can target therapies uh, more specifically uh, rather than what is actually currently going on in which just it's symptomatic treatment. If you're depressed, you can approach that. If you've got uh, you know, problems with sleep, we'll approach that. Rather than going to what's the underlying problem going on in the brain biologically in terms of developing a, a, a specific therapeutic approach, a preventive approach to that. And I think that's critical in terms of how, how we approach this rather than just kind of, you know, uh, treating it symptomatically. I think the, the other aspect is that, that I think is important is um, this is developed into a, a, a dichotomy of is it physical, is it biologic, or is it mental health? And many of the approaches have been, it's one or the other. You know, this is a mental health problem, we're gonna treat it as a mental health problem, or no, the brain is damaged, we're gonna treat it biologically. And actually, the fact of the matter is, it's both. It's both together. And I think approaches to this have to be looked at with a much broader view of both the biology and the mental health issues. They're clearly both present uh, in most of these cases. There's a lot of overlap, but, but, but it, uh, um, one does not preclude the other. So we, I think in our, our approach to this, we have to understand both aspects of uh, what's going on. Yeah, we see, you know, we see a lot of that overlap, PTS symptoms, TBI symptoms, and then you have that middle phase where there's a lot of overlap with the symptomology, um, specifically anxiety types of symptoms, sleep disturbance, mm -hmm. Um, sure. other aspects that are clearly not one or the other and require that team approach to get exactly. out of the stovepipe and, and look at the individual holistically. Um, with regard, so I'm going to switch gears with, because sleep is a huge issue, right? Military yeah. operates at night. We invert our sleep tables. We travel over, you know, across the globe to execute missions. There's all those different things that are biting into our um, sleep, good sleep quality. Can you talk, uh, Jen, a little bit about what is UT Dallas doing with regard to sleep and that concept? Yes, actually, um, we are, we've, we're collaborating a lot with Matt Walker. So if anyone knows Dr. Matt Walker, who is at Berkeley right now, um, he is really interested, I mean, his whole work is in sleep and looking at what is the impact on performance and how, how do we, I mean, even not getting, I think what he, he I said recently, five hours of sleep a night is equivalent to being a shift worker. So even for those of us that just don't have great sleep that we get interrupted, mm -hmm. and sleep, shift work has become, it's, a, it's dangerous. There's a lot of danger, and that exists in the military. And so I think we need to think about it. It, you need to do more than think about it. I worked with, we worked with a group of um, team guys once that they were talking about sleep and how they themselves train up for deployment by using sleep deprivation as their own training. And it was so heartening to see one of the guys stand up and say, no, no, we don't do that. Like they're really educating themselves and saying, you, we need to get more sleep here while we're here <laughs> so that we can kind of bank some of the sleep time for when we're in deployment. But I think that's another thing is that people know that this is really important, but they don't know what the right answer is, or they say, I don't need that much sleep, or they, they claim that there's so many things. And then I agree with our technologies and all the different things that affect and impact our sleep. So I've seen a lot of internal team guy education of themselves, which it's always from somebody that you, some, something that you read or something that you heard or something that works for me. 
And so I do think we need to do a better job overall of looking at how, what are the sleep parameters? We know that ad adults need seven to nine hours of sleep. And that is something that can be very challenging in the military, um, even with lifestyle. But again, I think that there's a lot of basic ideas and just kind of our own stigma, again, about what we need and what we don't and how we can go without. But I also want to address one thing that you were just, we were just talking about with mental health and TBI, kind of this aspect. I just wanted to, it's really cool to see, everyone knows that mental health has a negative impact on our cognitive skills, right? Like when we're anxious, when we're stressed, when we've got um, a lot going on, our cognitive skills can suffer. We can, our attention is poor, our working memory, a lot of things slip through the cracks, we're slower in our thinking. And so we've always seen this negative impact. But in some of our studies, what we've seen is a positive impact of how we train our brain and that when we're able to actually strengthen the frontal networks, it has a positive impact on self-reported stress, depression, and anxiety. And so I think that's something else to be thinking about is, right, it's strengthening the entire system can lift all boats, and it isn't just focusing on one thing or the other. Yeah, it's, again, it's that holistic piece of things, right? Everything that you're exposed to throughout your career can lead toward degradation, uh, and that has to be, and you need to have that self-awareness in order to you know, report and improve, and we have to have the programming available in order to do that. I'm going to get a little nerdy here, Dr. Pearl, in a way, because I'm going to hit up that sleep piece again. The importance of the part of the brain, the glymphatic pathway and recovery, what, how does that function overnight to enable someone to recover and or have you seen injuries there that cause symptomology and other aspects of pathology in, the, in, in your experience? Sure, important point. Um, why do we need sleep? Why is this so important? Uh, what, what happens when we sleep? And actually, uh, for many years, we really couldn't answer that question. But, but now, uh, more and more, we're getting more data on that. We, we understand more the basic uh, pathways that, that turn on, on and turn off the brain when we sleep but also things that happen while we sleep. And one of the, the aspects that's fairly newly described and, and, and studied is this glymphatic system, which is a system which removes essentially waste products. These are damaged proteins and, and, and other things that are removed from the brain and appear to be active during sleep. And if sleep is interrupted so that you're not getting good sleep, then this this waste removal system is malfunctioning. And we do have some evidence that in individuals who, who've suffered particularly repeated blast, evidence of, of damage or dysfunction of that lymphatic system, that waste removal system. So it's, it's certainly a, a particular concern. We're also beginning a study on the actual circuitry involved in sleep in blast-exposed individuals. Because we know that this disturbed sleep, uh, it's not just shipped for it, but, but in individuals who had repeated blast exposure, they report significant sleep dysfunction. It's very hard to treat. It doesn't seem to respond the way usual, you know, age-related sleep disorder and things like that respond. Uh, and if you go to a, a group of individuals who've had repeated blast exposure and you ask them, if I could wave a magic wand and remove one symptom that you have, headache, memory loss, whatever, what would it be? Universally, they will respond, Doc, just give me a good night's sleep. Right? It's very disruptive to life and um, we get an opportunity to talk to the, to the next of kin of these individuals who've died, to try to get a picture of what's going on in their life and a, a variety of things about their exposures and all of that. Um, and basically you hear how disruptive this sleep problem is. 
And what appears to have happened is that when the healthcare providers can't fix it right, with various medications, um, they turn to alcohol as self-treatment. Self and that doesn't work. And when that doesn't work, they turn to, to illicit drugs. And once they do that, typically within a year or so, it's suicide. Right? We have 92 suicide brains in this bank. It's an important cohort that we're studying actively. Uh, and, and you hear these stories, and one after another is the emphasis on this problem of sleep. So we think this is really critical, and we're now beginning to say, is this part of the biology? And, and we've engaged the, the world's experts in, in doing this, and uh, part, of, part of the research that we're doing is to look, look into what are the biologic underpinnings for this problem of sleep. We think it's critical, it's central to this whole problem. So, sounds like it would be a good fix, or at least uh, an approach to uh, try and achieve and optimize, uh, and maybe the outcomes would be different. It's hard to, you know, hard to forecast, but maybe the outcomes would be improved uh, in that regard. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit, and I'm gonna talk about another concept that's been out there, and that's the gut microbiome. So mm -hmm. um, the, some of the research is showing that blast exposure causes leaky gut. Leaky gut and some of the concept of those um, microbes can lead toward um, some degradation in brain function. I know you have an interest in nutrition and some of those areas. What, what, what do you think about that concept and how, how do you think we can approach that um, you know, across the force, Coast Guard first and across the force? Thanks for this. You know, I think it is interesting. I mean, when you think about how these pieces tie together and is it um, the alcohol that I have to use to make me think I'm going to fall asleep but this, my sleep is so degraded after that that it's almost non-sleep. Is it the blast? Is it the fact that you know I've, I've lost a lot of, um, there's this anhedonia here, so I'm not necessarily enjoying all the things I used to do, even if I loved to cook before. Maybe I eat more poorly now because I'm just, I'm not myself. You know, so is, it, is, it, is, it, is the gut leaky because of one's more ultra-processed food diet? Because that's what becomes convenient to you when you're, when you're um, on a spectrum of you know somewhere between depression and not 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 thinking the way I used to think, not sleeping enough, or you know, is it the blast injury? Like you know, so so how much of this is symbiotic? I think that's what we don't know because we see some of the other same issues in terms of gut health and and and, it, and leaky gut, um, really running roughshod over people's. They become septic, you know. They become they become um, again much more impacted neurologically and and, and um, neurofunctionally if they don't have a well sealed gut. And is it? it I mean, this is just think about this. This is pro where the the second half of our twentieth century. We it's almost like I mean I, mean, I just I tell myself my mom grew up in a period where everything was really there was this popular. Um, foods like banquet frozen chicken. <laughs> like if it came out of a freezer <laughs> and it went on your plate, it must have been good. TV dinners. TV <laughs> dinners was another one, exactly. <laughs> and so then you kind of intergenerationally don't teach people how to cook. Now, you know, I remember my grandmother, thank goodness, always cooked from scratch, always cooked her own beans, always made her own food. But I think that, that this, coming back to like what we eat and how we eat it, and you know what we use to anesthetize ourselves, whether it's the too much television watching, whether it's the it's the um, again the, the doom scrolling, the I doubt it's just your marathon running. That's the only thing that's uh, taking up your time. You know what I'm saying? I think that that we have so many ways in which we it's it's so much easier. How about this to be harmful to yourself, your body, your interpersonal communications or your brain health. 
and have it almost normalized. I mean, that's really the, the, the kind of scary part where we are in 2024. Yeah, that's good. I, I mean, so many choices to make bad choices <laughs> is one of those Too pieces, much right? Yeah. It does not allow you to focus. Understood. Uh, Jen, can you talk about, if you enter the program at UT Dallas, how does UT Dallas approach nutrition and brain health? So we have a lot of partners across the country and across the globe that actually provide a lot of this information to us. So when people are, when people are part of our studies and our programs that we do, we have a scalable way. So it's kind of nice. You don't have to come to UT Dallas anymore um, to actually participate in the things that we do. And we have a scalable solution that right now we're actually engaged. We have a really big civilian study called the Brain Health Project that has about 33,000 registrants. And what we do is we provide these you know, performance-based assessments and a lot of training content. It's, it, we're, we're providing a lot of information and ways for people to utilize healthier habits. Mm -hmm. And so we incorporate nutrition into that. We incorporate sleep into that. We incorporate stress solutions. And we're really starting to look at more things like curiosity, um, confidence, um, doing new things, the novelty, the effect of novelty. So ways that you can utilize your brain power in different ways. And we are finishing right now, well, we're engaged. We're, our study's coming to an end, but we have a study that's funded by MTech that's primarily working with the National Guard right now that service members and their spouses or their significant others have the opportunity to participate as well. And both of these programs are online. So they're scalable and you don't have to come to Dallas to do these things. And I think we're trying to cultivate the best and curate the best type of information that's out there to date. It's constantly changing. I think there's a lot of evolution and the new research. We were talking about what kind of education can stay behind the eight ball sometimes because we haven't caught up you know, to testing and all sorts of things. So um, yeah, I think that people can get a lot of information from the programs that we do that kind of span holistically the way that we look at and tend to our brain health. Very good. So I'm going to um, give a shout out to my organization. Within DOD, we have a lot of products at the Traumatic Brain Injury Center of Excellence that are open source and available. Um, tons of knowledge base that's there that should be utilized. Uh, and it talks about a lot of these subjects. Uh, I think now what we'll do before we have an opportunity to close is to take questions from the audience. If folks have questions, we'll take a few minutes to do that. And then I'll give you guys an opportunity to give us a few minutes to close out a message to our audience um, with regard to Warfighter Brain Health. So any questions from the audience, please come up to the microphone and let's hear, let's hear from you. I think that's yours, Admiral. Okay, <laughs> so that is that's that's a great way to frame this. That 
rather than stigma, even denial. And I'll, I'll just give you this uh, recent example we had uh, in the Coast Guard where it's nighttime and people are driving their small boat fast, very fast. And I'm not sure why or why they were going so fast, so fast that they, they hit a buoy. Now we put buoys in place, we're the Coast Guard. They knocked the buoy like almost in half. This is, a, this is an impact, right? There's four or five people on the boat. And whoever was looking down at the radar and everything else you could see inside the, the boat, somebody needed to have eyes up and out, like never forget that skill set. Yet we didn't find out about it like the first or second, maybe the third day. I mean, these are usually mishaps that would be reported fairly quickly. When it did get reported by the end of the first week, how do you think everyone was? They were fine. <laughs> I mean, they're fine. It's like I ran into something like as, as, as stout as a telephone pole and it's in half, but we are all okay. Because like you said, it's, it's, it's denial and it's like a team denial or a group denial that something bad has happened. We don't even want to entertain that fact. So if there was one person that may have been more jostled than the others, if the, if the idea was keep this on the down low, not even, you don't just say that out loud, right? We just don't want to draw attention to ourselves. I think that it's, it's, it's one of those things where we have to prove over and over again in safety that we have a just culture. That telling on yourself or telling about an incident that happened does not mean you're relieved or there's a punishment for that. And I think that, that again, one of the benefits of having health and safety and that, that, that you know, panoply of work-life programs sort of together, which includes everything from how we help people through transitions to the ombudsman, to like, again, touching with the families, the EAP. I think it's really in, an important blend of care that we're able to give. But it's really, it's like you're saying, it's leaning forward and always acknowledging, you know, when you have these stories and someone wasn't punished, nobody got in trouble. Yeah, I think it's one of those pieces where the system has to be responsive to the individuals and not punitive to the individuals mm -hmm. when they report, right? Our, our whole goal is to keep our force maximized for fighting wars uh, and executing missions. So, um, so that piece of it, uh, I, and I think we've come for full circle. I was in um, some deployed settings as a provider and had individuals trying to report exposures you know, 15 years ago, and folks saw a normal individual in front of them, the invisible wound, um, and not really putting two and two together. I think things have changed. Now it's more ensuring that it is a safe environment, that we're looking at this from a concept of performance um, rather than injury, and I think that will, will help to reduce some of that reporting requirement. Um, so, very good. Uh, next question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pearl, you want to take the brain markers portion of that question, and then Jen will get into sexy brain question on that regard? All right, all right. You know, it's, it's, interesting. it's a great question, and uh, we really don't have much in the way of markers in terms of, uh, you know, uh, improved brain function and what that's all about. I mean, we talk about plasticity, and this can be measured in detected experimentally in experimental animals, but in terms of doing this in the human, very little has been done. It's a whole area that I think is very important and uh, you know, maybe in the future we'll, we'll have better markers of that, but 
for them. I'm not sure at the moment we have much to tell you in terms of what, what that's all about. Okay, it's a great question and a, an important area. So those yeah. current concepts like that, um, Warfighter Brain Health wants to employ baseline neurocognitive assessment tests with automated type of tools. Um, I always think of the concept of shoot, move, communicate, the importance of a warfighter, right? Shoot, move, communicate, and the, the actions that should take place. So things like eye tracking, fixing target, the ability to hear effectively through background noise, and then the ability to speak and understand what scenario you're in along with the physical attributes and then the executive functioning. Do you think that we have enough tools to at least get started in that realm and have a, a I, good understanding? Yeah, I th I, we do. And I actually, this is an area where things like machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, can really start to contribute to it in terms of providing um, a background of uh, observations in terms of what, what changes occur uh, in these various uh, parameters. Um, it's, it's just beginning, uh, but uh, there are many people that are really uh, interested in applying these tools. They're very powerful uh, to brain science and to these particular questions in this particular space. And fortunately, with the availability of the brain repository that, that I run, we have the specimens available in terms of starting to look at that. So, of course, not everybody in the bank has been blast exposed or has had TBI. We have controls that have, you know, people who are, who've served, who've been cooks and clerks and uh, done, never been on a battlefield to compare to. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it's a, it's a new area of investigation and I think that it's an important area that we need to, to start looking at. Thank you. Well, and I just wanted ahead, to add that in some of the studies that we've done in healthy aging and in chronic TBI, we've done fMRI studies. And knowing that the brain changes as we get older with decreased brain blood flow and our connectivity of different networks kind of goes down, we've been able to see that how people use their brains can increase brain blood flow, can increase the connectivity of the central executive network, of the default mode network. And even in chronic TBI, we've seen some increase in hyperperfusion to the um, precuneus and cortical thickness. So I think there are a lot of some things that are starting to really look at what do these things mean and how do they, our whole goal is really to try to get toward precision brain health. So that when we're able to combine imaging with an imaging that's gonna serve as a proxy for everyone else, because imaging is very expensive, and fMRI in particular, but to be able to gauge what is it that, how are you changing, what are you doing behaviorally and on behavioral assessment, what does that, how can that help to direct us and to be more healthy from mm -hmm. kind of driving the brain from that way? Um, and I would actually, the other question, I think her other question was about making brain sexy, brain health sexy. I would, I would really love to know from the Admiral, from, you know, what is that? Because we are always looking at how do we make brain health sexy? How is it that you can start to make it so sticky that people, everyone in, in this room is on the boat with wanting to know where am I and how can I always get better and, and even if, how do I maintain? You know, I think even maintenance of our own brain health is a win. And so I'm, I'm really kind of curious from your own operational experience about making it sexy. So I think that one of the things that, um, that was, again, a tipping point happened during COVID, uh, the Defense Innovation Unit had shared some Garmin watches and some Aura rings. Again, I'm not advocating for either of these two particular brands, mm -hmm. but they they used them. I'll just go back for you know they they basically looked at patients who had been hospitalized for a non-infectious etiology, like 30,000 patients, but they all ended up with an infection, and they were just finishing this study in the beginning of 20. Like literally, they just had this data. So they now had a tool, which was a ring and a watch, and they ran it through a Phillips algorithm, a proprietarily owned algorithm, to give you a score between one, pretty much, zero might be dead, and 100. And so 
they said, hey, if all you have to do is wear this ring and this watch, and every day you can look on your phone and see what your score is, and if you're normally a two or a three, just think how great this is. Tomorrow I wake up and I'm a 24. Now, does it mean I have COVID? Might mean I have appendicitis. But what it means is what they did with these numbers is they said this is a preclinical bump. You see this before you actually become ill. You, that's why we know this, because we watched all these patients that went in for a good gallbladder to go out, but they got you know, an infection. And you're looking at heart rate variability, and you're looking at you know, respiratory rate, and you're looking at t temperature at night. But they put these into like four numbers, and you're looking at this. So I think, for, to me, because I'm a science geek, maybe, yeah. <laughs> but I think giving people some actual numbers that they can work with from themselves makes it a little bit sexier. It shows you how your heart rate variability, and for people who don't know this, if there was like one serum that I was gonna say, here's the magic serum that, 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 that is, drink this, it's an elixir, it's going to make you younger. The <laughs> thing that I would check is did your heart rate variability increase? Long line for that one, right? Right, and, but, <laughs> but, but heart rate variability, it's extremely concrete, and if it, it increased, I would say, oh, that probably did work. Mm -hmm. So. It's things like when you can associate just the lack of sleep you get every night with a, with a contracting heart rate variability. The number goes down and down and down, or how alcohol affects that. So I think in being able to give kids these days, they like to know why. <laughs> Can't just tell them what to do. It's not our old military. It's everyone wants to know the why. And I think showing people those things helps them be more on board with how they take care of themselves. Kind of challenging themselves to improve. Exactly. Type of thing. Um, very good questions. Uh, appreciate it. So we have a little over three minutes. So let's take 30 to 45 seconds and leave the audience with kind of a close from each of you. And uh, then we'll call it a day. Admiral? Over sure. There. I've really enjoyed the panel. I want to say thank you all for inviting me. And this was just such an important topic because these are invisible scars for many people. But like we've seen with other scar tissue, it can be remodeled. And I think that that's, I'm more hopeful today than I was even before I met you, the three of you and we started talking about this because I think that there's a way that these ideas really uplift people. Thank you. Dan? <sighs> wow. <laughs> this, is, this is clearly a very important problem. It's not a simple problem, it's very complex, and uh, we'll be needing to learn more and more about it. We first approach this in terms of looking at the acute exposure, particularly blast, right? And if you were exposed to an IED or suicide bomb, and over the next 24 hours you're, quote, okay, mm. then there was no damage. But more and more we were realizing that there were long-term effects that those long-term effects were significant and were severe. And then this evolved into looking at not so much the, the big blast, but multiple small blasts, such as are exposed to in training. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are significant too. And so more and more we're starting to define, and there are still many unanswered questions, how much is too much? When do, when do we have to say, okay, you need to stop doing what you're doing and take a knee and, and be in a safer place? And so uh, I think these are all very important concepts. I think we're trying, we're, we're starting to be able to provide some answers. It's gonna take time, but I think that these are important uh, uh, areas that we need to understand better. Very good, thank you. Uh, Jen? Uh, I would say for, when it comes to warfighter brain health, some of the important things for me are number one, remembering that um, brain health is more than just TBI, that we really need to think about the holistic person. Having number two, performance-based metrics that we can actually leverage rather than just thinking about it from a deficit-driven model. And then number three, having brain skills training as part of this left of boom, just like we do with physical training, thinking about how do we train our brains early on in our career pipelines 
so that this is something that we can carry forward with us to enhance and then help hopefully recover and rebound faster. Excellent, thank you. And so we'll close by uh, thanking everyone in the audience for being here with us today. Thank you to the Navy League, Sea, Air, and Space for hosting this very important uh, topic. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you.